Hello and welcome to another very special Valley Pass exclusive, high up in the east end of the Valley once again. This time we are joined by the club's new technical director, Jed Roddy. Good afternoon, Jed. Thank you for joining us. Afternoon. Thank you. It's, um, well, it's been an interesting few weeks is it, at the Valley, hasn't it? Um, how have you settled in for your first few weeks? Yeah, really well. I mean, I've been given a fantastic welcome by um, really everyone at the club. So, uh, but it's been a whirlwind, hasn't it? You know, um, we started by bringing in what nine, ten players, uh, and then went on this run of Tuesday, Saturday games, um, and thankfully we've been winning games as well. So, yeah, it's been a whirlwind, but um, I think we're moving in the right direction. That would be my sort of initial response, you know, Ollie. Absolutely. Um, we'll get into nitty gritty about what's going on now uh, sure. and what will be hopefully happening in the future. Um, later on um, but let's get into getting to know about you and about your background so where does it all begin for you as a as someone who's interested in sport and in particular football uh, when you go all the way back I know you played semi-professional and, and all that kind of stuff can you tell us a little bit about your early life in sport gosh uh, well I've been I've been I've been in the game for 30 years so so I go back quite a way uh, I know I don't look that old Ollie mm -hmm. but uh, um, I mean, I started out like most kids wanting to play at the top level um, and um, I've had a love of the game, you know, ever since. Um, grew up in the centre of Manchester um, and, uh, and, and, you know, as, as you just said, played non-league football um, and then went on like many that don't make it to the top level, uh, became a coach, became a PE teacher and started to develop through... Uh, the coaching side of the game and uh, you know I've been lucky enough since then to work with some great coaches along the way um, and um, yeah so that's how I started out I guess um, and you know over over the years I've worked in different parts of the country and, and obviously seen you know how, how the game has developed so uh, yeah I mean worked I guess my first coaching appointment was working actually at Bristol Rovers with um, the late Malcolm Allison and uh, people like that had a massive impression um, on me as, as, a, as a young coach um, coming through. So yeah, I mean, um, travelled around, worked with lots of different people and, and gradually sort of uh, developed my ideas around how players should be developed and obviously from there got into coaching in the academy uh, environment. Um, spent quite a lot of time um, at Bath at the university um, and developed a football program there for players that maybe hadn't made it um, as academy players and, um, and managed them, coached them, um, put them into the pyramid, uh, sort of went through promotions and took, took them on a bit of a journey. Um, but the most important thing about that project was that we were developing young players to go back into the game and um, and so I, I guess that was a real great learning period for me in terms of what's the art of the possible in terms of working with young players. Um, the biggest lesson from that period was that you just have to take your time with them you know they don't all come hurtling through at 17, 18 some of them need a little bit more time um, but if you create the right environment um, then then you can produce players at any level of the game. Mm. I mean, the, the team bath story in particular is, is, is a fascinating one. As you touched on there, the first university team to get to uh, the first round proper, the FA Cup in 123 years, I think it was. Seven promotions in, in nine seasons, I think that's right. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, can you tell, I mean, where did that journey begin? Was that a project that you set up, that you started? And it's not just the football either, was it? It was the wider sporting... I think it started um, because of my own experiences in the game. Um, um, you know, and recognising that um, there was a lot of talent um, out there that maybe was going untapped. So, um, you know, working in a university gave me an environment where I could bring these young players in and give them that little bit of time. Uh, the promotions, well, that was just great fun, you know, taking a, taking a club on a, on a journey from, you know, one man and his dog through to the, to the conference and what have you was... was 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 enjoyable um, on the whole. Some battles, um, but um, yeah, and some highlights. Taking the lads 
on the FA Cup run was great fun. But really, it was about getting that balance um, between um, developing them as footballers and then developing them, you know, in the whole in terms of their education and everything else. And look, just bringing it back to Charlton, you know, my first impressions coming in here are um, of an academy that's doing exactly that. And I've been really delighted to see the way things here are working because I, you know, I can relate to a lot of that, a lot of that activity that Steve and his colleagues are doing with the academy. It's, it's, a, it's a good environment here. So you spent a long time at University of Bath. Um, you were awarded an MBE in 2000 for your contribution to sport um, in the UK, uh, which is a fantastic achievement and one you must be very proud of. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was essentially um, because I spent uh, a lot of time really from the sort of mid-90s looking at um, not just how we develop footballers, but how do we develop athletes in all sorts of different sports. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty clear after the Olympics in 96 in Atlanta that the, 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 the way we were developing athletes in this country was just amateurish. So I set about developing a system at Bath and, 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 and sort of working with other people in the country. We established the English Institute of Sport and we started to professionalise the way athletes are developed. And you know now I think the UK probably leads the world in the way in which it develops uh, not just uh, not just athletes, but also its footballers as well. Um, and a lot of the lessons that I learnt during those years, I then I then applied when I was eventually invited to go and work at the Premier League. Um, but you know, it's taken 25 years to take you know UK sport from really a low level of, of performance in '96 at the Olympics to, to where it is today. So these things do take time. But I think the real lesson from what, we, what we've seen in British sport over this last generation is that um, not only have we built a system to develop young athletes, we've built a system which is long-term sustainable. And again, you know, this is, this is where we want to go with Charlton. We want to build uh, processes and, 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 and systems here to support the development of our players, which not just gives us wins next Tuesday, next Saturday, but actually build something that is sustainable for the long-term future of the club. As you say, though, you've, you've had your eyes across a, a host of sports, not just, not just football, but athletics. Sure. Uh, Bath Rugby as well, I believe. You, you did a bit of coaching there um, for a few seasons. Um, how does, I mean, that gives you a hell of a lot of experience um, for dealing with various people, different things. But, I mean, for a role like this now at Charlton, how much does it help that you've seen all of those different kinds of sports and all those different kinds of people and environments, it gives you a, a very well-rounded um, view of things, isn't it? I hope so. Um, I think what, what, um, you know, what we have to do here at Charlton is we have to remain curious. We have to be looking for uh, the opportunity to, to do things maybe slightly differently, to find the edge. And, and I guess that's really what I've been doing throughout my career. And, and I've had the opportunity to work with um, some incredible coaches, some incredible leaders um, and learn from them. And I think what I have learned is that they, they never stop questioning, they never stop looking for, you know, what's the next thing that we need to do. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, if we, can, if we can ensure that we have that type of culture and environment here at the club, then, then we won't go far wrong. Uh, I mean, one of those examples is joining the Premier League, introducing the Elite Player Performance Plan, EPPP. Yeah. Um, that was obviously a vision of yours and something that, that you thought needed to perhaps change to, uh, as far as youth development and football goes. Uh, how did that process work? And I mean, was it, it must have been quite a difficult thing to introduce and, and a, big, a big plan. Well, the way it worked was I, I was coaching back at Bath um, and I got a phone call uh, midweek um, and I thought it was one of the lads that was, you know, playing a prank on me. And the phone call was from Richard Scudamore, the then chief executive of the, of the, of the Premier League. And he said, oh, we want to come and watch one of your games. We were playing in the Southern League or something at the time. And I thought this can't be real. But sure enough, he turned up and he watched, watched the game and he saw what we were doing with the young players. And, and then actually, you know, it was a nice day and we wished him well. And then really it was then several years later that... Um, uh, that our paths crossed again and he invited me to take on this role at the Premier League uh, and his view was that you know we needed to do things differently I agreed 
um, it was clear that we weren't developing young players in this country at the level that, that, that we that we had the potential to. And so, you know, we set about building this performance plan to change the way uh, young players were, were, were coached um, and nurtured through the game. And yeah, it was challenging because there were a lot of people at the, at the outset, and when you try to do anything and create big change, you know, you're always gonna get some people that, that, that resist that and don't wanna come on the journey. So, you know, yeah, we, initially we had a lot of resistance to it. Um, I think now people can see 10 years, well, it's about 10 years now, um, and people can see now that the players that have come through and certainly are playing at, at the top level, um, you know, are, are sort of as good as anywhere else in the world. And the fact that you've got players now from the English system that are being exported to Germany, Spain and other places sort of tells you where we've got to. I think there's a, a respect for what is happening um, across the game in this country, which maybe we didn't have in the past, you know. It must give you quite a lot of satisfaction that you, you are seeing those positive impacts now coming to fruition and, and seeing those things take place. It does. Um, I think that, you know, the, the one thing that you know about player development is that it never stands still. And in, in the role that I was involved in most recently prior to coming and joining you guys here, I was working with FIFA and uh, I was working in different countries around the world and th they are not standing still. They can see what's happened in England and they are, they are working hard to ensure that they, they compete with us and in fact, you know, leap, leap across us. It's not surprising, is it, that the Germans have just gone into a big review of how they develop players and you can, you can see that they will, they will create uh, new initiatives in the, next, in the next couple of years and they'll try and make their leap forward. So the game is always evolving. Uh, you can't stand still. You've got to be looking for what the next, uh, the next thing is, um, whether that's here at, at Charlton or whether it's, you know, uh, across the globe. Yeah, we'll touch on that that work with FIFA in a moment. Um, but just briefly, you went from the Premier League to to Reading, a Category One club. Yeah. Um, how was that experience? Obviously, seeing seeing how a Category One team works, and and obviously we're Category Two at the moment with aspirations to one day become Category One. I mean, did yeah. you enjoy your time at Reading? Yeah, I loved it. Some good people there. Um, uh, it was challenging at times. I mean, we were flirting with relegation, um, and I can I can now very clearly remember Charlton coming across last season and absolutely taking us apart there. Um, and um, yeah, so some tough times as well. You know what it's like when, you, when you're chasing points. Um, and I think Reading have had their challenges with, with ownerships that have moved through different, I think they've had five or six different owners over a short period of time. So they've had their challenges, but overall, um, it was an enjoyable. It was enjoyable to work with the young players and the young talent that they had there. You know, and again, there are lots of clubs up and down the country that have sort of bundles of talented young players, and, and, and uh, you know, Reading would be one of those. Um, but you know, since I've come here, uh, in that in this first four weeks, I've managed to see every academy team down to the under 14s, and and in every team. I see talent, and and it's and that's exciting. Uh, as you said, most recently uh, you've been working on FIFA's uh, talent development program alongside Arsene Wenger, um, who is definitely worth a mention. Someone of his <laughs> pedigree. Um, how did it actually come about, and and what does it actually involve? Well, I think FIFA FIFA's a huge organisation. Obviously, they've got over two hundred countries, two hundred football associations connected with them. And um, I think for the first time, they, they've turned their eyes to player development and recognised that, you know, they needed, perhaps needed to do a bit more to support countries in terms of how they were developing their players. Um, and I think if you look at the big European nations, uh, like ourselves, like the Germans, like the Spanish and the French, then we've got evolved, developed systems. The countries, are, the world's a big place. And there's a lot of countries that don't have that, that sort of access to the knowledge and expertise. So I think FIFA sort of um, recognized this uh, in the last sort of 12, 18 months, made that very, really quite a clever appointment of Arsene Wenger who understands player development very well. And, um, and now they built this team around him um, from people around the world. And, and, uh, and they're looking to sort of raise the levels of player development across the, across the globe. 
So that brings us up to date with where we're at now. Um, technical director at Charlton. It wasn't long after Thomas Sangard's takeover of the club that, that you did arrive. Um, so where did that all begin? I mean, who picked up the phone to who? How did it become <coughs> I got a phone call out of the blue uh, and uh, was invited to come and meet uh, Thomas um, somewhere in Swindon, it was, actually. Um, and, and at the time, Thomas didn't, didn't uh, own the club, uh, but it was, was explaining what his plans were. Um, and it took me about 10 seconds to recognise that this guy was very serious about what he intended to do. And he wasn't going to take no for an answer in terms of getting hold of the club. Um, and, um, and when he asked me to get involved, I, I really didn't hesitate. You know, It was, it was such an obvious uh, opportunity for him to come and take this club on board. But also from my perspective, when you look at this club, it really is quite a special project that we're, that we're now developing. And, and you know, there are lots of clubs out there that can claim to uh, have aspirations to go back to the Premier League, but there are very few that, that can make that claim and then also look at sustaining themselves in that environment. And I think that's what, that's what Charlton's got. Um, but much more than that, you know, the support here um, through the tough times that the club has had has been magnificent. So you look at that and you think that there, 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 this is a proper football club. You know, it's got, it's got people around it that care about it. And then having come in and seen it for myself up close over the last few weeks, uh, the, the, behind the scenes, there's some great people that have kept this club alive. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think... Um, I'm telling any secrets. The club was very close to 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 really um, well, an awful scenario really. And I think um, if Thomas hadn't taken the club on when he did, I think we would have been staring at um, yeah administration at the very least, and and probably worse. Um, the club had run out of money uh, and really had run out of options. So his arrival uh, could not have been more timely, could it? Yeah, precisely. We were a couple of days away, weren't we? Um, so we know that your role is to, to oversee the club's long-term footballing strategy. Um, that's been mentioned. Um, so what does that actually involve on a, on a day-to-day basis? I know it's quite, quite a broad role, um, but what's a typical day for you, if that's an easy question to answer? Yeah, there's, I mean, I'm looking after all aspects of the football side of the club. So everything from the under-9s to the first team. Um, and obviously, you know, right now the focus is very clearly on making sure that the first team are, are in good shape. So in the first few weeks, you know, uh, making sure that Steve's properly supported so he can do what he needs to do on the recruitment side. And he's done a fantastic job to bring the, the, the guys in that he has done. And then making sure that Lee has got all the resources that he needs to go about doing his job effectively. And, you know, again, so far so good, you know. Things seem to be moving really well for us. But there's a lot of work to do. Let's not kid ourselves, you know. Um, this club, um, you know, I'm not going to pull my punches. This club has been hollowed out from the inside by previous owners. Um, and there's a lot of work to do now to rebuild it. Um, there's been, as I said already, there's some great people that have, um, you know, really worked hard to keep the club going. But they need help. Uh, and we need some resources to come in and support. So I think, you know, my, my job in the early stages will be to recognise where we need to do things slightly differently and maybe do a little bit of restructuring here and there and just make sure that the first club, is, uh, the first team in the first instance are sustained and, 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 and supported. Then we can start to look at the, the rest of the, of, of, the, of the football side of the club um, and you know, make sure that that pipeline of talent from the academy is coming through um, and, and continues to come through, so the tap has to stay on. Um, and to do that, we've got to make sure that the resources around them uh, are effective as well. As you said, I mean, the first goal really is to stabilise the club after what's gone on before it. That's the first big goal Absolutely. before we start taking leaps forward. Yeah. Um, I mean, what are the key things that, that do need to be done to, to make sure we can get ourselves in that position to then move forward? Well, the first thing was to get to get a, a, a squad that could be competitive, and I think we've got that. Um, so there's been some good recruitment has taken place. 
Um, we may need to do a little bit more to strengthen it, but I think, you know, we're, we're in pretty good shape. And, and now what we have to do is make sure that that group of players stays fit and healthy. So um, we need to put whatever resources there are around them to, to keep them on the pitch. Um, we're, we're playing so many games, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, uh, and they have uh, the players and the coaching staff, to be fair, have taken such a positive um, approach to it so far um, that we've done really well. And um, in some respects, you know, this break, this international break we've got now, uh, on the one hand, you don't want a break because we're winning games and you want to keep the run going. But I think that it comes at a good moment for us because it's just allowed us to take a breath, make sure the players get a bit of a rest uh, and, a, and a recuperated and ready to go for the next, the next block of games. Oli, we've got, I think, nine games in 24 days or something. So the next block is vital. So we need to hit this next block of games uh, fit and healthy and, 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 and let's see where we are at the end of that block. And, yeah. you know, and again, it's going to be intense. There's going to be a lot of football in a very short space of time. So, so managing that is, 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 is vital. And, you know, Lee has done a fantastic job so far of yeah. rotating his squad and, and bringing players in as and when he's needed them. I mean, obviously, it's been no secret that we've had a lot of injury problems over the last couple of years. It really hit us hard last season. Uh, we've seen a few injuries already. I mean, that, that's obviously down to some of the, the intensity of the games that we're, we're having coming thick and fast. Um, but also, there has been that lack of support, I think it's fair to say, across the, across the club in recent years under previous owners. Um, so is that something in particular as a department, the, the medical side of things, that, that does need a bit of help? Yeah, it does, and, and, and uh, we're going to restructure in that area. And you know, we've had conversations about that already um, at the training ground. We 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 need we need to bring some some new expertise in, uh, and we need to just just have a little look at what we're doing in that space because, um, you know, we're in a situation right now where we're playing more games than ever before. We, we've come off the back of not really having a proper pre-season, and as I said to you a few moments ago. You know, we've lost staff consistently over a number of years. So, so we're pretty much down to our bare bones in that area. So we need to build that back up. We need to create the support that's necessary for, for, um, for the players and give our players as good a chance as any to, to, uh, to kick on. Um, obviously, the centre of all that uh, is Sparrows Lane, the training ground, um, the hub of everything that really goes on yeah. in this club. Um, mm. That site has been earmarked for God knows how many years for, for some improvements. Um, are there any plans surrounding that in place? Obviously, it does make things more complicated with Roland de Châtelet being the, the owner of the land, the valley as well. Um, but, you know, is there anything in place as far as improving those things as best we can in that situation? Well, um, I've seen lots of plans since I arrived, <laughs> and I think everybody's seen lots of plans. So I'm very wary about talking about plans. Um, you know, what, and I think this... This period of, of Thomas's tenure has already been marked by or characterised by actually doing things and he's come in and he's done stuff and so, you know, I hope that I will, you know, approach things in the same way. We, all I'll say right now, Ollie, is we need to do something about the training ground. There are, some, there, are, there are some immediate things we have to do just to make sure the environment is fit for purpose to, to get us to the end of this season. So that's the focus right now. Beyond that, it's a wonderful, it has wonderful potential as a training ground. Um, and, you know, you'd like to think that, that we, could, uh, we could invest in it properly. Uh, well, we'll have to, you know, there's no two ways about that. Um, so so there's, we've already started to talk and look at, you know, the, the sort of the art of the possible with it. Um, and it is, a, it is, as you said, it's the hub of everything that we do um, in terms of you know the points that we win out there are earned on that on the training ground at Sparrows Lane. So, yeah, we've got to invest in it. Um, but at the moment, it's very much about doing doing things properly in the next few months and just putting some things in place to get us to the end of the season. And then I think we can take a longer look and go, okay, where are we now? And as you said, there are some complications in terms of ownership and what have you. But um, I think the watchword really on all of this is. Uh, we're in, we're working, we're stabilising the club, which is, which is the right thing to do right now. 
um, and, and, and then we start to build for the future. And hopefully we do that step by step. So you mentioned um, Lee Bowe and Steve Gannon offering their, your support to them during the transfer window when you first arrived. Yeah. Um, going forward, how does that relationship work as far as the, the first team footballing structure go? Well, I think um, you know Steve and Lee work very well together, and and and, and it's essential that the, that 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 relationship continues because we need to make sure that we've got the right players coming into the, into the club. I think in terms of the recruitment side of it. Um, I think we all want to get to a place where we're taking a longer term view of, of, of how we're recruiting players and I would hope in the future that we're not in a situation where we have to bring nine, ten players in in a window. We we want to move the club to a place where where that process is much more of a, of a sort of a organic, if you like, um, and it might be bringing one or two players in here and there. Let's not forget that we're also we've also got this requirement to develop players as well. So the relationship that the academy has to the first team is is important. If we're going to be successful in the future, I think there's a number of things we need to do. We need to be clever in our recruitment um, because we're never going to be at the front of the queue when it comes to the the, the money that we have available. Um, we've got to be able to develop players, continue to develop players that are capable of playing for our first team. And we're also going to have to be really good at trading players. So if we can do those three things effectively, um, then, then, I, then, then we can be successful in the long run. Um, Thomas, is, Thomas is a successful businessman and, and he has a number of you know, very successful businesses that he's running. But he's not uh, an oil rich state and he's not an oligarch. So this club has got a good owner but we are all going to have to work uh, you know, in a clever manner. And it's not unattainable what we're suggesting. It's just that we've got to do things properly. And, and I think that uh, if we do that, um, then we can be successful. So that requires uh, everybody at the training ground and indeed here at the stadium to be pulling together um, and with the focus of those three things, trading well, uh, recruiting cleverly and developing our own. I mean, as far as the development goes, it, it's helpful with, for the long term that we're in a position now where our promising young players, we are able to get under contract with for the next two or three years. We've already seen that since Thomas has come on board. So that helps as well, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And, and having that level of um, just uh, security uh, and, and sort of, you know, that feeling of, OK, we're, we're, we're here and there's a long term plan developing, I think is, is vital. And, and, and that helps players to see that they've got a future at this club. Um, makes it easier to recruit, makes it easier to retain them as well. Mm -hmm. And how about the working relationship with Steve Avery and the academy? Obviously, you, you, you've mentioned you've, you've already been down to watch the under-14s, 15s, 16s and, and up. Um, how will that relationship work with Steve? Yeah, I think in a similar manner to the, to the one with Steve Gallen, that, that you know, he's an in integral and important part of the, uh, the structure of the club. Um, he, he deserves great credit in the same way as Steve Gallon has done a fantastic job of bringing players in. Um, Steve Avery has done an incredible job, uh, at, first of all, keeping the academy alive and functioning very well. Um, and that's an understatement. I think I saw something on social media last week that um, our academy was producing as many players in the current Premier League squads as Barcelona. And I thought, well, that's a great, that's a lovely little stat. But you know what's even more impressive? is that when you take those same numbers, we as Charlton Athletic are producing more players than 25% of all of the other Category 1 clubs that, uh, that, that are currently in, in, in play. So, you know, with minimal resources, Steve Avery and his team have continued to provide this pipeline. And as I said to you a few moments ago, you have been down and had a look at the under-14s, the under-15s, the under-16s. And all the way through, there are players in there, really exciting young talents that, that, that in a few years, maybe less, will be out there wearing our shirt. And, and that gives me a buzz to know that, that we, you know, the, the cupboard is not bare. Um, people have been working behind the scenes and have kept this whole process going, which is fantastic. So you mentioned those other Category 1 clubs. Um, I guess we're a Category <coughs> 2 club at the moment. Um, the goal must be to, to reach that Category 1 status eventually, and I guess, does, does that work start now? 
Yeah, and I think the work has already started. The, start, the, work, the work started long before I came here because Steve has been producing Category 1 level players for, with his staff for a number of years. So, so you know, we're in, a, we're in good shape. We've got to get the facilities right. We need to put some more resource in place. Um, but obviously, with things that have happened locally, um, you know, it looks now more more important than ever that we that we go category one, and that's something that we'll have to look to in 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 the future. I guess you're f referring to Crystal Palace there as being you know our local rival to this summer went to category one. Um, does that make it more pressing for us as far as retention of players and staff as well? Of course, because um, we do run the risk of losing players and staff. Uh, not just ones that are already here, but when we're trying to bring and attract players here, if there's a Category 1 team down the road, it kind of makes it more difficult, doesn't it? I think, Oli, I think in the short term we're OK because this, this, uh, this football club and the academy that, that serves it stands up to scrutiny. And I think when you bring parents along and they see what their, their boys are going to be involved in, I think they recognise it and it's, it's got a good reputation in the game. So in the short term I think we're OK. But your question is, is 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 a good one, and and in the longer term, we 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 are going to be in a, a long term disadvantage. We've got our near neighbours now given a a a, a significant uh, opportunity to to recruit in a way that we can't um, to to uh, to be involved in a games program that we're not allowed access to. So on those two grounds alone, we 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 have to we have to step up. Um, but I'm not daunted by that. I mean, that's quite a nice challenge for us, and and um, you know, I think we'll uh, we'll take that one on, along with a number of the other challenges that we've got to we've got to meet in the next few years. Yeah, bring them on. Um, Absolutely. So we sit here now. It's the international break, uh, so we can enjoy a bit of a breather um, after an excellent run of results, a fantastic October with all those wins and clean sheets. Um, Thomas has been very clear about his ambitions of where he wants to be in the next few years. Um, it's very early days, but it's a, it's a very healthy start, isn't it? Yeah, it is a very healthy start. And, um, you know, I've been trying to um, just uh, speak to Thomas occasionally and say, look, we might, we might face some bumps in the road ahead of us, but he is nothing if not an optimist. And, uh, and I think it's so important that the guy that owns the club and is leading things uh, has this massive ambition for what he wants to achieve here because that just gives us all, you know, a clear direction of, of where of where we're going now, so you know uh, the important thing is to get behind that, um, work hard. Um, but you know, as any coach and manager is going to tell you, it's it's about the next game and the next game. And, and if we can build like that, then uh, I, I I can only see great times ahead for Charlton. Brilliant, uh, Jed. It's an exciting time to be a Charlton fan. Um, it's just beginning the journey. But um, thank you for joining us, and uh, here's to the rest of the season and beyond that. Thanks, Ollie.